why don't we get started? So let's just do between five and seven minutes since we have like around like um, five talks and then maybe two, three, four questions and then we'll have a buffer of 10 minutes more or less. So I remember that we have, I forgot your names, all of you. So, cause I know the GitHub handles only, but the first one that we have is a new Dask integration in flight. So whoever is in charge of that one, if you want to present yourself and then take over, that'll be awesome. Uh, yeah, I think it would be me. Hello, my name's, my name's Bernard. Um, I, I do currently work at, at Pachama where we use both uh, flight and Dask, uh, which is, uh, why we've built an integration to to connect the two, and yeah, I would like to give you. This is a very brief overview of what this does. I think there's a lot more to it. There's a blog post out. Um, there's a lot of resources that you you can go to. Free free also to ping me if your questions and to interrupt me like throughout the talk if if there's anything. So uh, this is very informal. Um, I also tried to do a live demo. Let's hope it works. Um, as always with live demos. So I do have a very brief presentation of stuff that I want to go over, um, but it shouldn't be too much. Can everybody see the presentation just by, yeah, okay. Okay, yeah, so perfect. this is um, the Dask uh, integration uh, presentation about the Dask integration for flight. The quick agenda for today, if it lets me, uh, the first reason is why, um, especially when I look at it from a very, like zoomed out scale, both of these tools are uh, task uh, orchestration systems. So, so I think there's a good, uh, might be nice to know why why we built this. Um, a bit about what Flight's compute model is and how it differs from Dask's compute model and why both are nice and both have their benefits. And then I'll, as I said, try to do a quick demo, which might fail as, as always with live demos. Um, the big why, so, or, or like why Flight? Um, it, for us, it's very useful as a high level orchestration tool. You imagine that you have uh, different teams, all of them have their own Docker images, their own libraries. And for us, that gives us a way to nicely separate out those uh, sometimes tricky dependencies that you get with Python. So every team has, has their own Docker file that they can run stuff in. And in addition, it is a very nice tool to do very simple task orchestration. So you can do run this task first, right? And, and it can build arbitrarily complex graphs with some limitations. Uh, but, but for regular work that we do, it's a very nice tool to just already do the, the, the task orchestration that we do in production. Um, you can build workflows similar to how you can build workflows in Dask. Uh, there's a nice UI that you can kick them off from. You'll, you'll see that in the demo. But probably the biggest thing that is lacking is um, as every flight task is, is run natively in Kubernetes is, and that's also the difference to, uh, to Dask that you have infrastructure on demand. So whenever a task runs, it runs as a pod in Kubernetes. So you create the pod, it has a startup time, it needs to pull the Docker image and all in all it has a start, startup time of around a couple of seconds. Whereas Dask tasks with a whole task cluster being up, the over task overhead is, I think I read on the, the, the uh, page somewhere, it's around a millisecond or so, uh, correct me if, if I'm wrong there. So it's really nice when you have workloads that are, that have really small tasks and a lot of them. So for us, that's uh, preparing images for, um, or pre-processing images or whatever. So I think there's a, um, a slight difference in, in that model. And you'll, you should see that in the, the demo. Uh, yeah. Why this integration? I think we fight, it's really nice that it manages all the infrastructure for us. Uh, it, there was already an integration for Spark, which is, I think, in a similar realm as, as Task is in, in terms of compute models. And we thought it would be nice if uh, Flight could also manage the, the whole Task infrastructure for us. So it should be very simple for us to just spin up a Task cluster, run our stuff on it, and Flight just handles the whole cluster creation and, and uh, teardown process. And I'm sorry if this was a bit much. Um, there's, as I said, there's a lot, lot to Flight. Um, I would like to follow up with 
with a, a quick demo, and I hope that makes makes things clearer. So what you see here is a typical <laughs> flight workflow with a, a workflow definition down here at the bottom. The, the workflow only has one one node, and this uh, in this case it has this this task task node. Um, the task task can be an arbitrary task task, anything basically that has a uses a client in the background. So you can have an explicit client, an implicit client, doesn't really matter. And if all goes well, this should also run locally. Let's see, might be that I have the wrong environment, could be. Um, so you get the, the, the same experience that you get when you develop with task locally, right? You can test this, you could put this into your unit test suite, whatever. Um, and this decorator up on top of the function makes this uh, a flight task that knows how to construct a task cluster. In this particular case, with a scheduler with a certain set of resources, uh, one worker group with one worker and some resources. Uh, and the third uh, limits here are for the job runner. So we also deploy a, a third port to Kubernetes, which is a, a, a client port that actually talks to the cluster. So you can also specify resources for that and it will run the same same computation. So you can go from very low scale to very large scale in, in a matter of, matter of seconds. Any questions up to here? Okay. Um, so, so when you have all this locally, I said it runs like regular Python functions, you can also connect different pieces. So you could have a pre-processing task running task, then a machine learning task on a GPU, uh, if you have a GPU locally, you could run all of this locally for, for testing. And then one um, serialization command that later I, I hit this behind a, a make command. But basically what this is doing is it builds a Docker image, pushes the Docker image to a registry. This is a bit of an optional step. And it registers the workflow with flight. You see, this takes about half a minute or so. Um, it usually also doesn't take much longer in, in a production use case. And then it shows up, this is the flight UI. But this is what you get when you uh, deploy your own, your own flight instance. You see a replica of this workflow. So this, this is these, this workflow that we have just deployed. I can launch it here. And when I click launch here, flight will now actually use a full scale uh, flight uh, full scale task cluster. So you will build up the task cluster that we specified and run the, run the task computation against against this cluster. So if I click launch here, and I can show you the Kubernetes background work here. Um, it, you should see it spins up a client pod, a scheduler, and the worker, and will run the the computation. This this can be arbitrary large. It's, it's, it's Kubernetes, and right. So we we've had clusters with. Well, like up to almost 100 nodes running that, that way. Then when it's finished, flight will tear down the cluster again, return the result of the task, and then it could technically run, run another task. Okay, and I think that was pretty much it uh, from my end. Thanks, Bernard. Do we have any questions? We have like room for one, two questions before we move on to the next one. I have a question, like just like that was really cool, Bernard. It was cool to like see like everything, a bunch of stuff happened behind the scenes just then, is my understanding. I would like to try to say all mm -hmm. those things, make sure I get it correctly. Like you copied local script and local files into a Docker image, you pushed the Docker image, you then like created a scheduler and workers in Kubernetes, probably using the Dask mm -hmm. operator, Kubernetes operator. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you then like ran the little Python function inside an environment which already had like connection information to the scheduler in mm -hmm. scopes like you had already created a client or something like that mm -hmm. um laws got put somewhere and like the thing happened um mm -hmm. yeah no that's cool there's a lot of like it's it's cool seeing all of the like your code called flight called the dask kubernetes operator called kubernetes called 
Docker call. Like there's a bunch of different things log on, pull up into a really smooth experience. That's that's neat. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I think it was more confusing than helping in the beginning. Um, I, I pulled this together in the, in the last like 10 minutes because uh, we, we did I, it come straight from work. Um, so um, this is what demo day is for. <laughs> so yeah, if you're like, there's a lot happening behind the scenes. Um, but the, the, the overall TLDR is probably if you have a flight instance, if that's something right that you're generally interested in, maybe another team already uses Spark um, or anything thing else that hooks up with flight. There's a lot of stuff. Um, it only takes installing the Dask operator, which is one Helm install, um, and then activating the plugin, and you're good to go. So you can manage your own um, instance. I, I think there's trade-offs, right? I think you wrote an article um, on the Dask blog of Kubernetes versus directly, like Coil, I think, hosts directly on, on VMs. I, I think there's, there's definitely trade-offs. Um, but considering those, if you want to host Dask on your own uh, infrastructure, it is very like if you have someone who can manage flight for you, uh, adding task integrations, like a 10 minute thing. Thank you. Is it recording? Great. So, Bernard, you mentioned about a blog post. Do you mind dropping it on the chat so then everyone can see and then we get the sure. link when we post sure. later? Awesome. So, next one line up is Paul for paralyzing FTP downloads for a junkie from a junkie government server. So, Paul, take over. Introduce yourself and you're muted. Yeah, thanks. Uh, right. So um, uh, years and years and years ago, by around 2010, uh, one of my colleagues, when I was working as a stormwater engineer, um, noticed that the FAA posts really weird files of weather data. And um, I kind of sprang into action at that point and found a library that could parse the format um, to show you the format. This is the weather data. Um, so uh, this gets parsed with a library called Python METAR. It was written by a guy named Tom Pollard, who's also a hydrologist who writes Python. Um, I'll go ahead and point out now that I'm starting. Um, if you look for some weather data, which is denoted with a P, um, it this is five minute data, but the precipitation data accumulates every hour and then drops back down to zero at a certain time. Sometimes that time is the top of the hour. Sometimes it's five minutes after the hour. Sometimes it's 10 or 15 minutes after the hour. Um, so that is like another challenge uh, that deals that you have to deal with when you're parsing this data. Um, the state is hosted on an F on an FAA FTP site and new files are posted every month. Um, the FTP is also very flaky. Um, so in addition to Python METAR, I wrote another library called CloudSide. Um, CloudSide's got a collection of functions that like helps parse this data. In addition to Python VTAR, it helps retrieve this data. Um, I'm importing some of these things here, but what I want to show you um, is kind of what the top level function to fetch that data looks like. And then I'm going to show you, well, I'm going to show you a re-implementation of that. That's much simpler. And then I'm going to show you what it looks like to re-implement that yet again with Dask in mind and the kind of performance benefits that are very easy to get from there. Um, so the first thing you do to fetch this data is you use the FTP library to see if the station exists for the year that you're interested in. And so um, I'm just using you know, uh, the FTP library and then it's stored in this folder which has this prefix and then you it's followed by a year and a station ID, some tries and accept. Once you find all those files, uh, same, similar story, use the FTP library to transfer that data to a file locally, um, check to make sure that things exist. Uh, I return a little status dictionary for that file. And then a, a function to parse a local file, which just loops through all of the lines, does, God, I think METAR has like 2,000 lines of regex in it. Um, so, you know, like definitely something you want to abstract away, which is why I'm so glad that library is written. And then these are some of those functions 
that we use to deal with the precipitation data. Um, you know, you, you kind of have to, this is hard in arid climates, but you have to look through kind of a breadth of data, try to find where the precip is most frequently zero, and that's your best guess at what the reset time is, and then just do all that. Um, I'm not going to execute this notebook. I did already, but if I try to find two years of data for two stations, Atlanta and Portland in this case, that's 48 months of data to retrieve and parse that on my fiber internet and my M1 Mac. All told, takes about four minutes. Um, which, you know, in some ways you only have to do this once, but in other ways, if you need to fetch a lot of data, um, you know, it scales linearly with all of the years and uh, uh, stations that you want to look at. So with Dask, it's very similar, um, but I did a couple of best practices. The first being, you know, since I'm going to use a coiled cluster, um, uh, I'm going to write my data to S3, not locally. Uh, and that has downstream benefits that we can discuss later. But, um, you know, this, this function isn't changed. The transfer function, besides the name, the only thing that's different um, uh, is that, you know, I'm, I'm using that S3 file system object to check on the file and, and, and save the file. Um, and then I, I actually got to simplify, uh, I, I, I pulled out from the parsing function yet another function that only deals with processing the preset data. We'll see why for that in a second. Um, and then basically, uh, I tried to find, uh, so I said, okay, I got 48 months of data in four minutes locally. And then I, aside from this, I iterated myself and figured out that I could get, um, let's see, this is uh, six years of data from nine stations. Um, I'm not gonna think about what kind of a increase factor that is on the fly. I, I could have pre-computed that, but I didn't. Um, but anyway, I, I did this and it turns out you can get this much data with a 20 node cluster in the same four minutes. Um, but I wanted to talk about the differences in implementing that. So the first thing I do is I create a list of tuples um, from the iter tools product function um, of all the stations and years that I want. I create a bag from that and then I map the function that lists all of the files. I, I probably don't need to use DAS to map that function. That's a pretty quick function, but I got, I got the cluster up, so I decided I would use it already. Um, uh, since this file, since this get all files function returns a list, this is going to turn into a list of lists. So I'm just going to flatten that real quick um, and then make a list of dictionaries that show like where my data is on the FTP and where I want to put it in S3. Create a bag of that. And then I'm just going to map the METAR parser to a wildcard string of all those files. So now I don't have to think about like which files what, just, you know, I'm just looking at all of the data as if it's one big blob. And that, that has a lot of benefits. Um, then I'm going to convert it to a data frame. And then across the partitions of that data frame, I'm going to process all of the preset data. This might be a coincidence. Maybe I actually can't rely on this, but because I'm storing the data in files for one station in month, the data frame as a result of this is partitioned by station and month. And so this I can easily map that process precip function to each file, which is how I was doing it originally locally, but with Dask, it kind of gets pulled behind the curtain a little bit. Um, and then I compute my summary stats. Um, I'm not going to execute this because it does take four minutes. Um, but uh, if you'll permit me that I pull the casserole dish from underneath the shelf for the cooking show, um, I timed it last night and it took four minutes. 
and um, computed some summary stats from 2006. And uh, interesting tidbit, uh, Portland got really hot at one point in time. Uh, these are temperatures in Celsius. Um, so this, this was the heat dome that made us as hot as Las Vegas had ever been. Um, let's see, okay, yeah, so I got my client. So I'll, I'll just set this in motion so we can maybe look at the dashboard since we like looking at dashboards. Yeah, we, we are at times so if you have questions while the dashboard shows pretty things. Yeah. Uh, that'll then, be great. Yeah, and then here is my S3 bucket uh, getting populated with a bunch of weird files. So anyway, uh, you know, I it's it's a big speed up and that's great. So thanks, thanks for having me. Do we have any questions for Paul? Some stuff uh, on the chat, but I I will just add that in the original cloud side library, I re-implemented my own re retries logic um, that just like try something increments a number and tries again until it gets to 10 and then says screw it we can't find it but with client.map just being able to pass retries equals 10 like actually reduced a lot of the complexity of the code so that was nice um got a question from mike uh can i elaborate on the jankiness have you reached out to the product owners at NOAA to see if there's a easier way to access um Mike, that's a great point. I have not reached out to them in a decade. Uh, <laughs> I, I reached out to them 10 years ago, and they were kind of like, the FTP is the FTP. Um, and, you know, um, you know, one thing I will note about the jinkiness is that when I execute this locally, I see a lot of retries happen, and then on the sixth try, it works. So I feel pretty good that the retry logic was worth doing. I'll also say that if you try to do this with a local cluster and you spin up seven or eight workers on your local cluster, the FTP recognizes that one computer is creating a bunch of connections to their FTP and it kicks you out. So um, hooray for Coiled for spreading out all those IP addresses and letting me fool them. <laughs> all right, thank you, Paul. We have... Up next, Rick, with configurable data frames backends. Uh, Paul, if you have any useful links and stuff or notebooks uh, that you show us and want to post it on the chat, that will be great. Sounds great. All right, Rick, floor is yours. Hopefully, I won't be too long for this demo. So I tried to focus on, you know, I was going to go through some hardcore examples and then realize, you know, I think that more of a educational approach here of bringing people up to speed on some work that we've been doing uh, recently in Dask data frame, Dask array um, for enabling the configuration of the backend library. Um, it would be useful to kind of just bring people up to speed. And so I'm gonna, this is now gonna be in a gist that I can add to the GitHub issue for this demo day. So if people wanna look at it later, they can, they can uh, go check out the gist, but I'll just go through it right now in real time talk through it real quick. And so, you know, the TLDR, the takeaway is really just that um, you can now run the same pass code on both you know, GPU and CPU systems. And so the context here is that, you know, I am a, um, I'm an engineer at, at NVIDIA. So I have a particular, I might be hearing somebody talking. Okay, there you go. Um, so I, I, yeah, so I'm from NVIDIA. So I have a particular interest in people being able to use GPUs with Dask, right? So we've spent a lot of, we've had a, we've, we've done a lot of work over the last few years of making Dask data frame uh, work with a QDF backend in the library called Dask QDF. Uh, there's also been a bunch of work for um, allowing Kupai to be the backend for Dask Array. But, you know, with this said, the original Dask Array and Dask data frame libraries are focused on pandas and NumPy. And so if you just install Dask, you, you know, import Dask and start using Dask data frame or Dask array, you're going to get pandas backed data frames and um, NumPy backed arrays. And so the whole point of this work is, well, we want people to be able to use those libraries, but configure the backend to be something else. 
And so that's what we can now do with the latest uh, version of Dask. And so uh, just to go through some examples um, for basic usage, we leverage the you know, configuration system in Dask. So the standard configuration system, if you check out Dask config, um, there are lots of fields that you can set and, and it, it's very useful to, to become familiar with the different options there, but we added this array backend and data frame backend options. So by default, the array backend will be NumPy, data frame backend will be pandas, but you could always change them by setting it like this. Um, as many of you are all aware, you can also do this in a YAML file or in a environment variables, or you can also set this within a, you know, a context. So if you just want to temporarily set the backend to something else, you can just do it with, in a with block. Uh, an important uh, consideration here is that the focus of these of this um, backend configuration is the collection creation. So Dask already has a lot of um, a lot of machinery to deal with dispatching based on the data type and you know array functions. We we leverage NEP18 for the array function protocol to dispatch the different backends, um, and that is when the data already exists. So the idea really here for creation dispatching is that well this is before the data exists and we are creating a new Dask collection. And something I forgot to mention in the beginning is that you'll notice throughout this entire um, notebook, there is not one place where I'm going to import Kupai or QDF or Dask QDF. And that's really the whole point here um, is that we just want to be able to use Dask as is without having to add any extra code for creating QDF for Kupai back collections. And so on the data frame side, we'll go through some data frame examples. These are the creation functions that are currently supported for the backend configuration. Um, they're, you know, the most common um, I/O functions, and all in addition to, you know, from dict, which is just saying, "Hey, I'm creating something from a dictionary of array-like things." And so, if you see this example right here, if I set the backend to be pandas, I'm going to get that data frame with a pandas backend, as you would expect. If I set the backend in a with block to be QDF, it takes a moment because it is now importing QDF. Um, you know, under the hood. And so just the first time you do this, it'll, you know, take a couple seconds. If I do that again, it's immediate because QDF is already imported. And so I get a, you see, I get a Dask QDF data frame and the back end is QDF. All right. And then, so another important distinction here is that um, we are really only, you'll notice that these methods that we are, uh, these functions that, that we are allowing dispatching for are, you know, creation or IO, whereas if the data really already exists, for example, if you're trying to create a Panda, uh, you're trying to create a DAS data frame from Pandas or from QDF or from some sort of array, um, you will just get the same data type that you already started with. Uh, so was this example? Yeah, so I don't know if I included, so we'll just stick with from array right now. So I don't have a from Pandas here, but from array, um, so since I'm starting with a NumPy array, you will automatically get, you know, what you would expect a pandas back data frame, even though the backend is set to QDF because we are, we are going with the data type that you already have. It's not really creation in that sense. So some array examples. Right now, array um, dispatching is a little bit more limited than um, data frame dispatching. Um, the, there is more work to be done, but what I mean by that is we really just have you know, creation and not really IO yet. So creation being like, you're just trying to create one zeros or some random um, array. So an example, if I set the back end to NumPy, I get a NumPy back a task array, as you'd expect. If I set the back end to Kupai, I'll get a, a Kupai back data frame, as you'd expect. And this is what I just mentioned before, that right now we don't have IO functions um, configured yet, but there is probably work in, to be done soon. And also users can um, leverage the two backend methods, which I'll describe next, and that's more recent. So if you want to move an existing collection, now I mentioned in the beginning that really the goal here is creation or collection creation, but that leaves you with this possibility that, hey, your backend doesn't actually support the IO function that you really want. And so you'll end up you know, there's really no possibility of reading in a HDF5 into GPU for now. Um, but you might want to read in an HDF5 
read from an HDF5 source and then move it to Kupai to do processing, for example, or you might want to do something and move pandas, move a pandas collection to QDF. And so there's one more um, method that we added here. It's called to backend. So if I start here with a pandas back data frame, you can just use to backend to make sure that you're moving your, your um, collection to the desired backend. So here it's moved to QDF. And in this example, if you specify a specific backend within the two backend uh, method, it will override whatever your configuration is because you're saying, no, I actually want to move it to pandas. And so here you get a pandas backend. And so a little bit of how it works, I won't go into too much detail here. I'm gonna add some links at the bottom to documentation, everything, but um, this is just, you know, um, this is just dispatching that uses a, um, and sorry, we, we use entry points here. So what, what, what Dask exposes now on is um, entry points under the group dask.array.backends and dask.dataframe.backends. And it defines these dask array backend entry point classes and dask frame backend entry point classes. And so other libraries or internal libraries within Dask can define these entry points to specify how, you know, really what it is Dask should do for these various um, IO and creation functions that are um, configurable. Now, on top of that, those libraries, if they're outside of Dask, would need to expose the entry points um, in their, you know, setup.cfg file or setup.py file. Um, and this way, uh, a library like QDF, or sorry, a library like Dask QDF will, when installed, automatically um, become recognized or, yeah, become recognized by Dask when it is looking for backends. And so here, uh, before I, I, and that's pretty much it, but I just wanted to mention like a side note on some related work, um, because what the whole point here is, is to improve user experience for users who want to use QD, or want to use GPUs as well as CPUs. Uh, we've also improved the behavior of, you know, what if you already have a Dask array and you want to convert it to a Dask data frame? In the past, this was problematic for GPU users, but now it works pretty um, smoothly. So for example, if you have a QD at Kupai backed um, array and you just do from array, you now get, um, yeah, from array, you now get a, a, a QDF data frame, a QDF back data frame collection, which wasn't the, the, the case in the past. So I think that's a nice little update to add. You're kind of tacking that on here. And so here, there's some links that I'm gonna, um, that you can always access here to see more information. So it will be in the gist that I, um, that I add to the GitHub um, issue about demo day. So yeah, that's it for me. Hopefully I didn't take too long. Nice. Thank you, Rick. Do we have any questions for Rick? Have maybe one yeah, minute to. Um... I've got a quick question. Yeah, Rick. So yeah, also thanks for, for showing this. This is really nice to see. Um, so if I want to use Dask on GPUs, ignoring like provisioning a cluster with, with GPUs, the actual Dask looking code is it, is it fair to say all I need to do is say at the top set the config? I want the you know QDF backend for data frame or Kupai backend for array, and then that's it. All the code looks the same. All all the rest of like desk collection code looks the same. Yes, exactly. And so um, in the beginning, I kind of had meant to clarify. Yeah, we're not talking about like distributed or using Dask CUDA for spinning up a cluster or like a GPU enabled cluster. Um, this is just saying you know the Dask data frame or Dask array code, when you are writing that, using that API, you no longer need to say, oh, I have to actually import Dask QDF or I need to directly import Kupai or anything else. Um, so now that is all just covered, just using this configuration system. And so you can right. set it by environment variable. That's, that's correct. So you can also yep. use um, environment variables, um, which is useful if you're kind of spinning up a cluster and you say, oh, I actually have a Dask CUDA cluster. I'm gonna change my environment variables to be using Kupai and QDF. So yeah, that's a good point. So these are basically like put those two config values are like put Dask in GPU mode and now all your code looks the same. So yes, cool. Exactly. Nice. Thanks, Rick. Uh, so up next we have Guido. Guido, if you're ready. Hello. Can you hear me yes. now? We can hear you Perfect. now. All right. Good. Take over. All right. So uh, today I would like to talk about uh, somewhat uh, advanced use of XGBoost uh, parallelized on Dask. So um, we uh, we want to run Optuna 
to do hyperparameter optimization uh, doing training of running on XGBoost on a fairly large data set. And so we want to run training uh, exercises many times, let's say 50 or 100 or whatever, that these training exercises individually don't take that long, but when, when you do them all together, they add up to many hours. So we want to make them faster. The way we engineer this is that you have a Jupyter notebook or whatever your client that start, runs locally your Optuna optimizer. Inside Optuna, you have a local thread pool. And in every thread pool, you have threads and every thread runs a separate coiled cluster. Now, people will say, wait, what? Why don't you just create a single cluster with more workers? Well, the problem is that XGBoost is a C-level uh, MPI application and the Dask wrapper is just a thin layer on top of that. So when XGBoost starts, it monopolizes a Dask cluster and that works reasonably well if you have a single uh, optimization exercise that takes very long. If you have many exercises that individually take only a few seconds, then things get quite inefficient and wonky. So this way, XGBoost can still think, okay, I have a medium-sized cluster and that's it. Whereas actually you can have 10 or 20 of them in parallel, they will not know about each other and they will just run independently. So now each independent cluster in parallel, you will have Optuna that sends trials with different hyperparameters. Each will read from S3 the same data set. In our case, we're using uh, New York City taxes, which we have pre-processed uh, beforehand. And that data set is reused over and over. So let's move to the... Uh, notebook, I will start reading from the bottom. So we create a study in uh, we don't, this is you might local. make it. Do you mind making it a little bigger? Uh, uh, the, yes, sure. The font size is 10 years. Better? Great. Better? OK. So we create a study, and then we provoke optimize locally. Uh, optimize and we run n trials, which is a big number, for example, 50 on however many clusters we want to create, for example, 10. And this means that every cluster on average will receive five trials to run. Um, all of this is run locally when then you get into a thread. In every thread, you start a coil cluster. Each is start running independently from each other. And in every thread, you start a work cluster and you preload the data from S3. Now you have 10 clusters with 10 parallel copies of your data ready to uh, train on. And then you move to the training itself, which is, again, xgboost.dust.train. All of this is running in a local thread. And then it's sending the actual workload to the Dask cluster associated with that thread. And then you get the, uh, you get everything back and you return to Optuna, which will decide a new set of uh, hyperparameters, which are hopefully gonna converge to the lowest score. The score being giving your test data as you do the prediction on the test X, you compare to the test Y and you see how much are they, how different are they? The, the one with the lowest difference wins. Um, for this purpose of time, I've been running it uh, beforehand. Um, here I have started four clusters, but in real, but I, before I was uh, running on 10. Here I have four clusters with 20 workers. Before I was using 10 clusters with 50 workers each. So. Uh, half a thousand workers before, and each of them is running uh, separately. Uh, optimizations, I can open a random one. Let's see the dashboard, how it looks. And it's 
right now it's doing a training exercise this is probably too small to read it says dispatch train and that's the mpi worker that is internal to xgboost that does the thing and it alternates between training the the metrics build train and uh and test and rinse and repeat many many times but this that you're, look, you're seeing is one of the four clusters and the same thing is going on in parallel at the same time. And you can see here that it's um, running and this is the output from the previous run, which gave me the best parameters for this and the best uh, score, which is, which is a, um, an R value and some kind of analysis. Is this the only way to do it? No, it isn't. You could run uh, Optuna.optimize inside Dask itself, which would be nicer, but XGBoost doesn't quite cooperate with that. With other libraries, that's better, but uh, that is a somewhat long-term work in progress. Um, are there questions? Uh, Guido, I don't have a question, but this is this is very cool. Um, you know, I, I was involved in kind of developing this workflow, and to see your improvements on it is great. For whatever reason, I cannot see the chat. Are there questions on the chat that I'm not reading? Guido, I'll put in the link to the GitHub repository. I think you made. I also yep. encourage you to take a look at it because it shows the progression of adding more and more layers of complexity. It's actually cool to see, like, just ask that as from playing, and then desk, just ask an XG boost, and then adding an Optuna, and adding an Optuna in threads, then using like more advanced techniques in DAS to put them all in the same cluster. It's a fun progression to see the like the extra layers um, of this problem. Yeah, um, I'm going to post a link to the repo right now. I've beat you to it, Guido. But ah, it's, it's a fun thing to, to see if you want to look at the increasing increasing complexity. What would you fix, Guido, if you had a month? How would you make this better? Uh, if I had a month, uh, I could fix about some paper cuts. Um, the problem is it's very hard to re re rewrite an MPI model to work in uh, uh, in Dask, which instead is task-based and, and directly acidic graph-based. Um, but there are things that can be improved, particularly in the terms of resilience. Like right now, if you have a single worker dying, everything falls over, you can implement some sort of resilience there for sure. Great. Uh, thank you, Guido. If you if we don't have any more questions for Guido, then we should move on on to the next one, which is accelerated tracker similarity using Rapids and Dask. Um, if you wait, if you want to take Hello. over. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Here yeah, I'm back. So hopefully I have clicked all those things. I guess Hi. I'm going to find out. Um, share screen. Desktop. Sure. Yay. Does that work? <laughs> yes. Awesome. Awesome. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Zue from NVIDIA Rapids QML team. So um, I'm also fairly active on Kaggle. So uh, this demo uh, is for people who speak QDI for Pandas, but who are intrigued by the potential of Dask. So and want to move their workloads from, say, QDF to Dask QDF. So I'm going to use the uh, Jakar similarity as, a, as, as an example. So computing Jakar similarity from texts. So for example, so we, let's say we have a two documents. So the, the first document is Hello John. They're actually the same, right? So except for, except for the spelling of John. So um, yeah, so, we, so first we use this uh, sliding windows to, uh, to get the n grams. So here we use like five gram uh, actually. Um, and uh, and we form a set of all the pass, all the unique engrams uh, of the two documents. So the chakra similarity here is defined as you know uh, the size 
of the intersection of these two sets divided by the size of the union of these two sets. So uh, yeah, so you can imagine to handle this in the data frame. So uh, yeah, the, the, pack, the data frame library should be able to handle nested lists because now we are, we are splitting one string to list of strings. And it should also be able to handle like calculating the size of a set and calculating the size of the intersection and uh, the size of the union. So yeah, so this is uh, what, what it looks like. Uh, I mean, so the input and the output um, of this demo. So the input are, the, are two JSONL files. So the first JSONL files contain the texts we care about. So each line is actually a document uh, and uh, it's associated with the ADLR ID, which, which is simply uh, identifier for each document. And um, yeah, in this particular use case, we have, a, we have the so-called bucket. So these documents are already pre-grouped into each bucket based on some hashing algorithm. So for example, the, uh, the bucket column is actually the bucket ID. The first bucket contains three documents and uh, we wanna compute the jar card similarity between the documents in the same bucket. So that's why, yeah, so we can use Dask QDF to read the JSON files. So we have like hundreds of these JSON files or thousands of these JSON files. And we merge the two data frame to create pairs. We merge on the bucket call uh, on the ADLR ID column. Yeah. So, and then we compute the jar card for, you know, the pairs, the pairs of documents in the same bucket. So the output is a data frame. Um, it shows like uh, uh, the pairs uh, for each bucket and uh, the, uh, the jar card similarity for each pair of documents. Would, yeah. So you mind making it a little bigger? Uh, oh yeah, sure. Bump up um, the size. Yeah, sure. Let me try to Command make it plus. bigger. There we go. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So anyway, so the the contents of the I mean the contents of the the uh, the data frame uh, it's not really that important. It's more, most important are the column. What are the columns we're dealing with? Um, yeah. So let me let me just jump to the numbers and uh, so these are the key takeaways. Uh, in this demo, I'm going to show how we optimize the pipeline step by step. So we start from a fairly naive pipeline. So just to naively can uh, transform, convert my QDF code to Dask QDF. So we call we call it a baseline code, and then we find out how to correctly use UCX, and we already cut the the total runtime by half. So yeah, so the, these are the uh, the time in terms of seconds. And, uh, and then we figure out so we can further use map partitions uh, to remove some, to replace some extensive merge operations. And uh, yeah, we also compare it to the CPUs. So um, actually, so these CPU uh, bars, so they were not using Dask originally. So they were using uh, handwritten like Python code and uh, I mean, uh, and MPI uh, and uh, Python multiprocessing to utilize all the cores and nodes. So uh, these two bars are, are run on a single node. And um, yeah, so uh, as you can see here, so we divide the runtime to two parts. So the pre-process is actually the IO part. So reading the JSONL files from disk and then compute the jar card. And then so form the pairs of documents and compute the jar card. So uh, our optimized, so these, all these GPU bars are our final optimized version. So our optimized the GPU workloads, so they um, accelerate the uh, computing jar card part significantly. So like in the end, so we have almost like 10X speed up, um, uh, I mean, for our 16 GPUs configuration over the 48 core CPU baseline. Yeah, okay, so I think that's all for the slide. I, I'm, I'm going to compare, like I have two notebooks, the baseline and our optimized version. So I'll just uh, make them uh, make them side by side. Uh, let me do it this way, actually. Uh, okay, yeah, I like to do it this way. Um, maybe I can make them a little bit smaller. Uh, is this still okay? Yeah, I guess so. So yeah, yeah so okay. So basically, uh, both notebooks are using are running on eight GPUs. Uh, yeah. So the the 
Okay, so the optimized one on the first eight GPUs and the baseline runs on the last, on the next eight GPUs. And uh, they are almost the same notebook, except for some minor, I mean, minor change, but which, but which made significant, I mean, difference in terms of time, time, uh, time saved. So the first difference is we need to install the correct version of UCX. So that's very surprising to me, actually. So my colleague actually pointed it Pointed, pointed this out to me that, so originally in the baseline version on the right-hand side, so I'm using this UCX Pi 0.29 version. And this is from like our stable channel, so the Rapids AI, I mean, uh, Conda channel. However, he told me like, you, I should use the Nile version and the, the version number is 0.30 something. Um, he might also mention that he compiled it from the source. So I'm not quite sure about that one. But you know, this version matters a lot. So it's like this single change, this single update of the UCX Pi library can save a lot of time. And uh, yeah, so, and we uh, we get a launch in the cluster, all these stuff are the same. So let's just jump to the next section. Yeah, so here we are reading uh, the text, text L JSON file. So yeah, so DaskODF now has an engine to read JSON files directly and that they can, they can process I mean, so in, in the line, line format, so each line is a JSON a project a object. And uh, so you can read that into a data frame. So I think all these are identical. So let me just uh, jump to the next part. Um, yeah, all these are, are the same. So I'll just uh, jump to the, uh, scroll down, scroll down. Okay, so these are the form the pairs. Yeah, so let me jump to, jump here actually. So yeah, up to, up to this point, so this is like, so let's look at the, the difference it makes. So in the baseline version, so I have to use 30 batches. So you can imagine each batch is very, very small comparing to the optimized versions. I just use two batches. So the batch size is much, is much larger. So they look identical. So these two parts of code, so the magic is how I compute the jar card for each pair. So the, the implementation of this function compute jar card pair is different. So if we go up, so we can now, so that's the difference. So in the baseline, um, I mean, so I literally just translate, uh, translate late my QDF code to Dask QDF. So I have this, I created a pair and uh, I calculate the results of the jar card and merge the results. So I'm talking about these lines. So I merge the results back to my DDF pair on some column. So yeah, so after that, we realized that this is, this is completely unnecessary because you know the, each pair is actually in the same row. So it can be done at the partition level. So we, so we move the bulk of the computation into a map partition function. So that's why, so that's this new additional function. So we compute jar card in the partition. So, and we remove the merge. Instead of doing merge, we find we can just do assignments. So we can, we just assign, you know, the, the, um, the, the jar card values we calculated to the data frame directly, because now we are working at the partition level. So the results of this compute jar card is simply a CoolPy array. So we simply assign it to the, you know, to the partition, which is a QDF data frame. So, I mean, so everything above, so, uh, I mean, everything above computing jar card are, are identical. So we explode, you can imagine we, uh, we get the engrams from the text and we explode the lists and, uh, and we find out how, where, what is the inter, uh, intersection uh, set, what the, what's the union set, we calculate the jar card. The, the main difference is we use assignment instead of merge and we move all those computations into the map partition part. So this makes a dramatic difference. So in terms of time saving and uh, you know, memory consumption saving. So because you know, everything at, happened at the partition level, so it's a, we no longer have the out of memory issue here. So here, due to the out of memory issue, we have to use very, very small batch size and here we can use very large batch size and we save a lot of time. So uh, uh, this one doesn't even finish. So anyway, I think you get my point. So it's a, um, these are fairly simple, I mean, usage of, uh, I mean, 
fairly standard techniques to uh, use task QDF efficiently. But I think it helped me a lot to go through this journey. I mean, convert my QDF workload on a single GPU to task QDF workload on multiple GPUs and potentially multiple nodes, multiple GPUs. So uh, I mean, so after I understand these concepts, so uh, the entire workload is accelerated significantly. Yeah, I think that's all. Nice. Yeah, we are at time, so that's like perfect timing. Uh, quickly, you said like like the baseline didn't finish, but how long was running like compared to the two minutes yeah. of the other ones? Do you yeah. remember? That, yes. So we do have this. Uh, we do have this uh, uh, chart. So these are the. I mean, running everything using sixteen right. GPU. So these are this. This is the baseline, and this is the final optimized version. So the final optimized version is four X. Uh, nice. I mean, faster than the baseline. Nice. Do we have one question, or we have we are at yeah, time, sure. so the one like so. If do we have any any questions for Jiwei? If not, we'll call this a wrap. Um, going once, going twice. All right, so. Thank you all for uh, sharing your talks with us. If you're interested in giving a next talk, I share on the chat, like I posted an issue that is like from the community, just sign up in there, said, when would you like to give a talk? Um, so next next demo day will be on March 16th. Uh, it's also a Thursday at the same time. Uh, so I would like to see some folks sign up in there. If not, I'm gonna be bugging you personally to get to give a, a talk in there. Uh, um, yeah, thank, thank you all for sharing. Um, we are at time, so great to see you all. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone.